I introduce myself as the pain, poop, and pot nurse to lighten the mood a little bit and also to kind of emphasize the importance of constipation. Now the focus has shifted from how one assesses and manages pain very much to how to use no opioids to relieve pain or how to use the least amount of opioids. So we've lost the fact that opioids do have benefits. Ask the question, if we could do a better job with your pain management, what will you be able to do that you can't now? because that's gonna help us set the patient's goal and it's measurable. You're listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast, where ONS Voices Talk Cancer, a resource from the Oncology Nursing Society. Through conversations with the subject matter experts, we examine the important issues in oncology nursing from new treatments to patient-centered research to advancements in clinical practice. Join us as we hear from nurses in all facets of oncology care, from bench to bedside and everywhere in between. Welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. I'm your host, Stephanie Jardine, Oncology Clinical Specialist at ONS. And today we are joined by ONS member Judith Pace, Director of the Cancer Pain Program in the Division of Hematology Oncology, Research Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois, and member of the Chicago ONS chapter, to discuss prescribing and utilizing opioids for managing cancer pain. Dr. Pace is also presenting on the topic during the 2021 ONS Bridge virtual conference in September. We've included a link to learn more about ONS Bridge in the episode notes. Thanks for joining me today, Judy. Happy to. So as an oncology nurse, we are going to definitely have patients that are experiencing pain. Sometimes it's due to the tumor or location of that tumor or due to the treatment side effects. So to start us off, tell us the key points oncology nurses and patients should know about causes of cancer-related pain and how to manage that pain, whether it's with or without opioid medications. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much and, and to the entire committee of the ONS Bridge Conference for focusing on this topic and allowing me the opportunity to share information, um, to shine a spotlight on this, this issue because cancer pain is, as you said, so prominent. So the first thing is, as always, we want to know the underlying etiology if we can, right? We don't always know for sure. Then the usual causes of pain in a person with cancer are either related to the tumor or related to what we do. That would be surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and all the different treatment options. And Some of those pain syndromes are acute, like mucositis, and some of them are more chronic, like graft-versus-host disease. And then there's a third cause of pain that we see in people with cancer, and we can't forget about this because it's becoming more common, and that is non-cancer causes of pain. For example, we are seeing this silver tsunami increasing prevalence of uh, older patients in our practice. And cancer tends to be a disease seen more often in people with more years um, around the sun. And so we're going to see things like arthritis, um, degenerative disease in the spine. And so we also need to be prepared to treat those kinds of syndromes as well. And how we treat them, you've alluded to this, is there's the pharmacologic therapy that we use, and that includes non-opioids, which are the NSAIDs and acetaminophen, could be the opioids, and then the adjuvant analgesics. And then we can't forget the non-farm, which includes physical measures like rehab, PT, OT, integrative techniques like acupuncture, tai chi, cognitive behavioral kinds of therapies, commitment therapy, mindfulness, relaxation kinds of techniques, 
interventional approaches. This is where we get our either anesthesia colleagues or interventional radiology colleagues to do different kinds of blocks or ablative procedures. And all of this together is called multimodal care or holistic care, where we don't rely on just one agent. We rely on a variety of treatments. That's such a good overview for us. And really, I like how you pulled in that third part that, you know, we are having to consider um, with the silver tsunami. And, you know, those are things that probably, you know, when we as, you know, practicing nurses are taking care of our patients, you know, we're so focused on that oncology diagnosis and things like that. It's so important for us to remember that, you know, there are some of these other comorbid you know, things that patients have that they come already with. And so it's going to be, you know, kind of that add on to considering in their care and how we, how we take care of these patients. Can you explain the benefits for us and the risks of managing cancer pain with opioid medications? Of course. So the benefits are pretty obvious, although they've gotten lost in the whole debate about the opioid epidemic. And I just want to say upfront, the opioid epidemic is a very serious problem and cancer pain is a serious problem. And one concern I have is that we were making progress educating all healthcare professionals about pain management, including cancer pain. But now the focus has shifted from how one assesses and manages pain very much to how to use no opioids to relieve pain or how to use the least amount of opioids. So we've lost the fact that opioids do have benefits. They relieve pain. That's number one. Yes, they have risks. Acutely, we worry about respiratory depression particularly in people at risk. Those would be folks with obstructive sleep apnea, people who are on other sedating medications, people who have had a pulmonary comorbid diseases, procedures where there might be large uh, thoracic or abdominal incisions. And we tend to see respiratory depression more on the inpatient side and when people are first being given opioids. So that's the acute adverse effect that we worry about. Long-term, there are some long-term side effects of opioids, but of course, the one that everyone is so very focused on right now is substance use disorder and the potential for people to misuse these agents. I just want to reassure people that there really are strategies we can use to identify people who are at risk and then to mitigate that risk. Thank you for that. That's um, a great way to look at it. And I think it is so important for us to have this conversation because as you said, we were doing a really good job in educating folks. And I think patients are so worried about the opioid epidemic that they just get very, very concerned and nervous when, you know, if this is the direction of treatment option that they're kind of guided to and to have this conversation so that we can all understand it better. I think it's just so important. So let's talk a little bit about assessment. What are important assessment questions that nurses should ask about pain to help inform the provider's prescribing choices? So as you just said, Stephanie, there is, you didn't use the word stigma, but that's really what you've talked about, that people are so worried. And with a lot of media attention to the opioid epidemic and misuse, there is fear. So when we assess pain, we assess function, and we assess risk of misuse, Throughout that process, through all the questions, I'm also listening for the stigma that patients may have, their beliefs about opioids, 
their fears about opioids. And you'll be able to hear it in some of the words they use. They'll, they'll say, well, I, I was given this particular medicine and I don't want to be on that stuff. You know, I, I heard on the radio or I heard on TV about the problems. So keep your ears open throughout. But the, the assessment is where we start because you can't treat something without really understanding what you're treating. So a very strong history. And you all know wh what those questions are. You know, where is the pain? Or in most of our patients, again, back to that, you know, complex individual, many people are going to have multiple sites of pain. So make sure we capture all the areas. What is the quality of the pain? And that's what I hair missed the most. And I'll use words. Is it aching, throbbing, burning, tingling, electrical, shooting, squeezing, pressure, painful numbness? And that will help me to categorize the pain. Either it's nociceptive, neuropathic, or visceral. And the treatment may change based upon those three kinds of pain syndromes. This is also the time when I ask about, you know, what have they used in the past? Let's not reinvent the wheel. What's worked? What didn't work? What were the side effects? This is also an excellent opportunity to correct misconceptions. For example, if a patient does say, you know, I've had an opioid before, but, you know, I threw up. Well, that doesn't mean you're allergic to the medicine, which is the conclusion that many people may draw. And then, you know, we talk about their function. You know, tell me what you're able to do. What's your typical day like? Can you walk around the block? Are you going to work? Can you cook meals for yourself or for your family? And then I often ask the question, if we could do a better job with your pain management, what will you be able to do that you can't now? Because that's going to help us set the goal set the patient's goal, and it's measurable. I know that there's been a lot of debate about zero to 10 as a measure of intensity, and it is pretty frustrating for any of us who've ever been you know, in healthcare uh, as a patient, and you've been asked that question. It's not easy to answer. Plus, there's so much variability. But if we use function as our outcome, then we can gauge more accurately if our regimen has been successful. So those are the questions that I ask about the pain. And then I spend a lot of time on the questions about their risk of misuse. And those questions include their current or past use of substances. And of course, we start with the more socially acceptable things like smoking and alcohol use. And then I'll usually move on to cannabis Especially, you know, in my state, it's we have a medical and recreational use legislation. So I do want to know what people are using and and what was their goal of using it. Did they have they always been a recreational user for many years, or have they just started to try different products in an effort to get some symptom control? And then I'll very specifically um, and explicitly ask: And do you use heroin? Do you use cocaine? Do you use methamphetamine? And we've included that one more recently because there is a pretty significant upsurge in um, misuse of that substance. So I ask about that, both past and present. Some people will use different tools, paper and pencil or tablet-based tools, and those have been validated in non-cancer populations. I like to kind of drill down a little bit more. For example, I have a lot of patients, um, I'll ask, you know, do you smoke cigarettes? Oh, no. But I kind of do know that they used to at least. And so I'll say, you never smoke cigarettes? Oh, yeah, I used to. And when did you quit? Oh, last month when I was diagnosed. So if you just used a paper and pencil tool, you might miss that they actually have a 30-pack year history. So I find that to be really important. In addition to asking about current and past use of substances, I also ask about family history, and I'm pretty explicit. Biologic family members, grandparents, parents, siblings, any adolescent or adult children you have, anybody have trouble with alcohol misuse? 
And then I ask about substance misuse. And then the final question I ask, and I usually give them that palliative care warning shot because it's not a pleasant question. I will ask them about abuse. Have they ever experienced abuse? And then a certain percentage of people will say no, and they'll be kind of confused. And I'll say, you're probably wondering why I asked that question. And they'll say, yeah, I didn't really anticipate that. And I'll say, well, we know that people who have been abused, particularly as children or as adolescents, we know that this is one of the strongest risk factors for addiction. Are you worried about becoming addicted to your medicines? And that opens up a really great teachable moment for those people who have experienced abuse. I typically will express my my condolences for them, my sadness for them. I wish that that had not happened. Did they ever get some help for that? And that it helps me a lot to know whether they might benefit from a referral to one of our psychologists or social workers, or even to someone outside of our system for assistance. So those are the questions that I ask about pain And then the questions that I ask about the potential risk factors that they possess for substance use disorder. That was a long answer, Stephanie. I hope that was helpful. It was so helpful, Judy. Just a couple things that you talked about that just resonated um, with me in thinking about, you know, how we interact with our patients. But the first one was when you ask them, you were talking about this pain scale of one to 10, but you ask them what their goal would be if they didn't have pain, what could they do? And I just love that. I mean, it's just, it's really providing them the opportunity to not only be involved in, you know, this decision-making and things like that, but also, you know, kind of to can maintain that control over the whole diagnosis But if they can tell you that my goal is to be able to go for a walk with my grandchild and not be completely uncomfortable, you know, that gives them some of that control back. And I just, you know, what a great way to involve them. And then the other thing that you were talking about just at the end, when you were talking about the risk factors and It was just very interesting to me as you're talking about, you know, what may be, you know, cause them to be at higher risk for misuse and just how everything in our life is so interconnected. And the, you know, fact that if there is a history of abuse, or like you said, just even asking a little bit further in the questions about, you know, smoking so that oh no, I haven't smoked, but last week I just stopped or last month, like you said, and that's, you know, great because you're right. Unless you actually get in there and sometimes, you know, ask those questions or ask a little bit more, we may not get that answer. And so those were just some really, really valuable tools that you just shared with us that I think will be so helpful to our listeners. So I want to talk a little bit or ask you to talk a little bit about common side effects, uh, whether they're immediate side effects or long-term adverse side effects that patients can experience with opioids. Thank you. I'm going to laugh here because, Stephanie, um, people are so embarrassed about talking about their bowel habits. So I like to use humor. So I introduce myself as the pain, poop, and pot nurse in the oncology clinics. Again, just to lighten the mood a little bit and also to kind of emphasize the importance of constipation. There are side effects of opioids, and this is the one that I see as one of the greatest barriers, particularly on the outpatient side, but also inpatient as well. So I use the opportunity to educate people, to be frank. One of the barriers we have with managing constipation is, um, first of all, people don't understand 
like the role of the large intestine, which I get that, you know, if you're an accountant, who's, who's really focused on the large bowel, but helping people to understand that there is peristalsis or muscular movement that pushes the stool and that the opioids slow that down. And that when the stool is just sitting there, there's also this absorption or reabsorption of water or fluids from the stool back into the lining of the gut. And that means slow moving, hard stools. So what can we use? And there are a variety of agents um, that one can use. And frankly, there's a lot that work and there are a lot of studies that need to be done. Um, There are some studies actually that tell you that Senna doesn't work. There's another study that shows that DocuSate doesn't work. I find actually that Senna and DocuSate together, if taken on a regular basis, do help. One of the challenges though, is that pretty much the majority of the substances we use to help people are over the counter insurance doesn't pay. And for people who are under financial limitations, that's that's a bit of a challenge. So there are two parts to managing constipation. One is prevention. And the second is what I like to call the dynamite. And again, it's about education. You could have the best regimen in the world, but if people don't understand, they're not going to be able to use it appropriately. So One of the golden rules is you need to have a bowel movement every day or every other day. And I wish I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, well, but I'm not eating. I would be a very wealthy woman. Frankly, the colon still produces stuff that's got to come out, right? So a bowel movement every day or every other day, soft, not hard, no straining, no blood on the toilet tissue, right? So if we can get just the right prevention regimen going, then we can achieve that in the vast majority of cases. That should never be an obstacle to using opioids for pain control, for serious pain. And then the second is, as I joke about the dynamite. So if it's been day two and you haven't had a bowel movement and you're starting to feel a little bit full, then this is a good time to try either magnesium-based products. The gentle one is milk of magnesia. You can use magnesium citrate, but not the whole bottle. You can use bisacodyl if you need a little bit more of a laxative effect. So there are a variety of agents people can try. And then, of course, there are prescription strength uh, medications. Unfortunately, I find that most of them, at least in my practice here in my area or my neck of the woods, I end up having to do prior authorizations for most of those. So that's a little bit of a challenge. It creates delays. But overall, constipation can be managed. It just requires knowledge on the patient's part. So our role is to educate. Excellent. So ONS has developed guidelines to help nurses with opioid-induced constipation. What are some of those best practices? Are there, are there any other, anything different than what you've already mentioned for that? ONS guidelines on constipation management are very helpful. It's the implementation that nurses have such an important role in helping people understand what are the major factors that need to be considered. Things like, how often should I have a bowel movement? What should the texture of that bowel movement be? What are the other medicines that cause constipation? You know, we all point fingers at the opioids, but we use ondansetron a lot for its anti-emetic effects, highly constipating, as well as other agents as well. So helping people understand what are the causes of constipation, the importance of treating it. This is not just something that we should let go. I, oh, I get... Um, pretty dismayed when someone comes to me and says, Judy, I haven't had a bowel movement in seven days. Ouch, this is going to be a really painful process. I didn't do a great job of teaching in the very beginning. So education, 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 implementation of the guidelines. So we've talked a little bit about those um, adverse events or adverse experiences that patients have with opioids as far as the side effects go. But, and you've talked a a lot about the education that nurses need to do, especially with that constipation. But are there 
other things that when we are educating patients about taking opioids that nurses need to remember as part of their patient education. One of the most important things we can do for individual patients, for their loved ones, and for our community is to educate patients and families about safe storage. It is ironic to me that people are so concerned about the opioid epidemic and they hear the opioid epidemic again in media all the time. And then when I mention to them that they really need to lock up their medicines, many people are somewhat shocked. So I try to personalize it. You know, some of these medicines are bright colors, they're round, they look like candies. You would never want your grandchild to accidentally think that this is something to eat because it could be fatal. And then I also give the examples, you know, if you need to have a repair person come into your home, a plumber, a cleaning person, if they have addictive disease and they know you have cancer, they might make the assumption that you've got pain medicines in the house and they might look for it when you're not right there and they will steal it, and then you will be out of your medicines. So helping people understand that they shouldn't leave these medicines out in the medicine cabinet in the bathroom, the kitchen cabinets or kitchen counter. I had one patient put it in a, really, it wasn't a very high up cabinet, but she said it's high up so people can't reach it. And I I showed her that I sure could reach it and I'm not that tall. So she couldn't reach it, but other people could. And, you know, I, I don't mean to make light of it. It's so important that we lock this stuff up just to keep our, our loved ones safe, to keep our community safe. So spending some time discussing safe storage. Some people may have a cabinet or a file cabinet that has a lock on it. Uh, People may want to buy like a small fishing box or a jewelry box or something that has a lock on it. So important to prevent others from getting access to the medicines purposefully or accidentally. Thank you. That's a really, really good point. And as you said, I think patients that are not concerned about taking opioids or maybe don't understand, you know, some of the people who are misusing it, you know, are probably very surprised at some of those things that you mentioned um, when we're talking to them. This has been amazing um, having this conversation with you, and I'm sure we could go on for at least another half an hour, (laughs) Um, but our time is short and there are a few questions that I always like to end our our conversations with on the podcast. And I want to run through those questions kind of um, in a uh, fast style with you. So the first one I have is what are common misconceptions about the use of opioids to manage cancer pain? Yeah, people perceive that if they're being prescribed an opioid, it must mean the end. A common refrain I hear is, my grandmother died on morphine. And so they think that this must mean that they are in the very terminal phases of their disease, when in fact, I'll keep reframing it. The whole goal of the opioids is to keep you functional. And by keeping you functional, you'll be able to tolerate this treatment better. You're, if you can walk, you're not going to get blood clots. If you can breathe deeply, you'll be less likely to get pneumonia. So all of these interventions that we're employing are to keep you functional, to keep you able to manage to, and to, uh, to get through the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, stem cell transplant, whatever procedures we've got planned. This does not mean the end. And in fact, when you are done with this treatment, there's a strong possibility we'll be able to very easily wean you off the opioids. Next question, what is something about opioids that's not often discussed, but you wish people knew more about? There's two things. Um, One, Again, because of the stigma, because of the focus on the opioid epidemic, and Stephanie, just as we've been talking, I just got a push notification, 
Drug overdose deaths in 2020 hit the highest number ever recorded in the U.S. So again, that's more information. It's terrible information. It's an extraordinarily sad data point that we're going to have to help reframe for our patients. But because of that fear and this this prevalence of this other epidemic, people are so concerned. And so they'll take lots and lots of drugs like NSAIDs. And I've been seeing clinicians prescribing lots and lots of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for our patients. And I'm seeing more and more gastric bleeds as a result. So in for many of our patients, opioids are safer than non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So that's I think something that's not often discussed, remember that NSAIDs can cause GI bleeds. They can exacerbate kidney dysfunction and they increase the risk of MI and stroke. So I'm not saying that NSAIDs have no role. They clearly have a role in carefully selected patients. But right away, there's this knee-jerk reaction that those drugs are somehow safer because they're over-the-counter. So I think there are some several other kinds of things, but I know our time is short. But I, w- I wanted to emphasize that, that opioids, again, because of the stigma, are often not used when they should be. Good points. Really, really good points there. What are some additional resources, both for patients and providers who want to learn more about opioid medications? That's great. So let's focus on patients for a moment. There are lots and lots and lots of really useful resources. It would take all of our time to go through all of them, but three that are quick. The American Cancer Society has some lovely teaching tools. The National Cancer Institute has something called the PDQ. They're kind of fast facts and nice long articles. Uh, They're evidence-based and they have them actually for professionals that are referenced and in much more detail. And then for patients that are in a little bit more patient-related language. So that's through the NCI. And ASCO ONS has some great uh, patient teaching tools. For nurses, um, a same oncology nursing society has a wealth of resources available. They've got a great position statement that is reminding us all about our ethical responsibility to treat pain. And then I'd also like to highlight the End of Life Nursing Education Consortium, or ELNIC, which has courses and materials online for professionals, nurses primarily related to the care of patients with serious illness. And we do have a course that's very specific to nurses working in oncology, particularly uh, advanced practice nurses. So lots and lots of resources, and those are just a few of the highlights. Well, thank you so much. Um, Judy, this has been just so valuable, this conversation. And like I said, we could probably go on for at least a half an hour or longer, but I just appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. And I'm very excited about your session for Bridge. And I know that you'll get into a lot more information in that session that we weren't able to touch on today. So I hope um, folks will uh, join you for that as well. But do you have any final comments for us today? Oh, Stephanie, first, I want to just thank you so much for highlighting this challenge of cancer pain. And I would just encourage every oncology nurse to speak up and advocate for our patients. I know you do it on an individual basis. Never hesitate doing it in larger forums like the public. Um, Remember, nurses are the number one respected profession amongst all professions and particularly amongst healthcare professionals. So you have a voice and thank you for all you do. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Judy. I really appreciate it. And thank you for your expertise and your just commitment to helping patients who are experiencing cancer pain and for helping to educate oncology nurses and those taking care of those patients. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Oncology Nursing Podcast. Tell us about your favorite part of this episode by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you downloaded your podcast. For more resources and information about oncology nursing, visit us at ons.org or voice.ons.org. 
The ideas and opinions shared in this episode represent those of the guests and not necessarily ONS.